So we're going to do two sessions uh, back to back and then uh, hopefully end even on time or maybe a few minutes early. Um, this is the complementary session on DPLA as platform to follow up on Jeff Lick's discussion of the technical development scheme. Uh, I'm going to welcome up uh, SJ Klein, but also I think Martin Kalfatovic, uh, the two directors of the uh, co-chairs, I suppose is the official term of the Technical Aspects Workstream, and they are going to talk about the DPLA as platform, uh, which as you'll see is a complementary approach to the approach that we've been taking with Jeff Licht with Pod and iFactory. So uh, SJ and Martin, thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody. We're here today to talk not about the platform as a technical process, which Jeffrey handled so well earlier, but really as a platform as something that can take you someplace. So here we have our evocative graphic of the platform that will take you someplace, in this case, to Chicago. What we don't want to also mention, though, is that the platform is a magical thing. And again, thanks to the ImageThink people, this is a um, picture from the October presentation last year of just how we were discussing the platform and what it would become. At the time, we knew it wouldn't be magic and that it would really be nuts and bolts and gritty and eye beams and all that type of stuff that really makes things work. So what we now have is a DPLA platform that we can actually start doing stuff with, a platform that'll take us places that we can do interesting things with. And how do we get to the platform? Well, one thing that we did want to do is thank some of the people that actually helped us get to where the platform is today. Um, key to that is David Weinberger, who was with us yesterday, and David led the interim tech development group that brought about the whole platform. Just a quick round of applause for David, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today. And also Chris Freeland of Washington University in St. Louis now, who was our original co-chair of the group. Um, we have our list of names of the different people up there. And I did want to highlight just one person, which is Lee Dirks. Men Lee Dirks was a friend of many of us. He was a good friend of libraries. He was a very good friend of the DPLA. And tragically, we lost him in October to a car accident. But it was just uh, great working with Lee on this project. And again, it, a lot of what we have today is dependent on what Lee helped us build. So again, as um, Jeffrey mentioned, we've had a lot of other things happening on the DPLA platform. Back in April, we had our first hackathon. We actually called it a mini hackathon. We did it really quickly on a, sh on a short time frame. We squeezed it in between the Berkman um, Harvard Education Lady Gaga event, and thanks to all the Berkman staff for helping us get this all organized in really short notice. And this was our first experiment in sort of getting the platform out there and getting people out there all around the country to build on top of that. Similarly, we had the beta sprint that was launched previously in October of 2011. And again, as Jeffrey mentioned, we hope to have some of those beta sprinters continue on in terms of developing on top of the platform as we move forward with the new DPLA. And again, as you've heard, we have the DPLA App Fest coming forward in, the next, in next month. And again, Nate Hill, who couldn't be with us today as his wife is having a baby. I don't know if she's had a, had a yet. She, okay. So Nate is now a father. Um, and thanks to Nate for uh, um, bringing us together with the Chattanooga hack, hack people, and I think the Chattanooga event's going to be great, and again, we want to encourage people all around the country to participate in it virtually if you can't actually make it to the Chattanooga event. So what we want to do now is just do some quick questions of the audience of where you think the DPLA platform can take you or your community, and for that, I'm going to turn it over to SJ. Thanks, Mark. What I love about coming to DPLA events is that um, we aren't one single community. We're a lot of very different communities who don't, uh, who don't actually get to hang out together very often outside this, this forum. And sometimes I'm completely blown away. I mean, you have, you have the entire development cycle of an idea from the authors to the publishers to the archivists to the reusers and the communities that are trying to mine things out of their community's data 100 years later. And for me, at least, work, doing a lot of work with grassroots-based data analysis and, and data munging, it's so nice to see everyone playing nicely together and, and uh, being thoughtful together about what the future of libraries should be, what the future of, of knowledge sharing should be. So uh, I'd love to hear a little bit from the different communities in the audience what DPLA as a platform means to you. And uh, there have been some amazing ideas that came out of the last couple of days. A number of people saying, here are the things that, that we've been working on and developing that we hope to see shared with other people. 
Other groups saying, here's what we've been waiting to get access to that we haven't had access to because we were too small or we were, um, we're out, of, out of the circle of light where you have free access to different kinds of collections. And uh, so I'd like everyone here to think about what DPLA as a platform means to your community, to the people who you serve, and, uh, and what it might mean to products you currently have in development. How many people here have organized or hosted some kind of a hacking or data event at their institution in the last year. That's great. Uh, every one of those events sort of gets, gets channeled, channeled a bit by the institution that hosts it. You have a chance to direct the efforts of some of your, some of your own people who haven't had a, a chance, you know, the, the free energy to go relax and do something new for a day and a half or a couple of days, and all the people in, in, in your neighborhood who haven't had a chance to work with you. Um, this is the first time that, that, we, will, that we will have a, uh, some active things for people to hack on in the last six or seven months. I've been, I'm really enthusiastic about how quickly some things are moving, uh, and I loved the way Paul Courant put it when he said, this is our chance to have fun. Uh, we can experiment. Things are, things are falling into place, and if, when, you, when you get an inspiration about something you want to see, even if you don't know how to do it, you can ask. You can ask for um, something like that to happen. So I'd, I'd like to call on, uh, on some people in the audience. Um, I know Michael Calford uh, is here from, from the Boston Public Library. And you've been doing a lot of work with the state of Massachusetts on the Commonwealth collections. When I was first asked to just say a couple of words about this, um, Boston Public Library is, is organizing the um, Digital Commonwealth uh, pilot hub for um, DPLA, and a lot has been said about smaller libraries and the branding issues and the advocacy issues, and I see the platform as being able to really focus in on the very unique collections that we've all talked about. Very small public libraries and historical societies across the state or across the country have, and um, by working and being part of the DPLA, it really shines a light on them, exposes them, so that we found at the Boston Public Library when we started doing this work, helping smaller institutions to digitize their collections, that legislators and funders really like that, and they really took notice of that because it really serves their individual communities, but then it just broadens it all out to um, a, much more, a much larger perspective, and it kind of gives them bragging rights, and they can really say that they're part of a much bigger thing. And with this whole ability to <clears throat> develop apps on top of this platform. You know, we all know that the people who are developing apps are kids that could be anywhere in the, some sleepy little town in Western Mass or in the middle of the country. So we see this as a really great opportunity for the small institutions that would never be able to get their uh, very unique collections out to anyone that, but the very few people who come into their institutions. Thanks. And is, is Alan and Ovia here? So uh, Alan, Alan works at uh, ALA in Washington office and the kinds, of, the kinds of policy questions that, uh, that you all have to deal with are really important. Um, I'd, love to hear, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how this affects your community. Uh, sure, just a, a few things. Uh, so Maureen Sullivan, our president, talked about access. And so, so instead of Michael talked about uh, uh, collections and getting the collections out from small libraries out to many other people so they can see them, uh, we're thinking, access for all, but also access for particular populations. Uh, so for access for, for those who are in small communities, who, you know, this provides, or has the potential of providing tremendous capability and resources. And so providing the access to those folks is, is one of the things that really, really appeals to us as ALA. Uh, but also access for children and youth as education becomes more dependent on primary, primary materials. And so it's another, this could be you know, a huge boon for, for that population. Uh, and access for people with disabilities. As information becomes more and more tied up in contracts and licensing, uh, we don't have as many rights as we used to in terms of doing things for people with disabilities. So in terms of access, we're really excited about the potential for, for DPLA. And it's not even cautious uh, potential. We, it's real potential coming, so we're very excited to see that. Uh, the other thing is the, I think, the difference between the commercial and non-commercial sectors. So some of you may know that we've been doing a lot of work with the big six publishers and e-books and trying to get better access for, for libraries. Uh, but it kind of raises the larger issue of, uh, you know, there's all this wonderful non-commercial content out there, and how do we make better use of that? 
and that that's actually a competitive advantage for libraries if we can just figure out how to make better use and provide services and you know, it's all kind of atomized now. And so DPLA is, is really the catalyst that can help us bring this material together and provide better and better services that are, that are interesting. Uh, so we won't be so dependent on you know, the best sellers from trade publishers and so on, uh, you know, which I, I've come to learn is a very problematic process to, or problem to, to attack. So it's another, that's another way of thinking about DPLA. There, there were a lot of nice ideas about, also in discussions today, about how a new platform might help libraries think, uh, think about themselves in a, different, in a different context or be, be used by uh, the majority of the, of the people in their cities that, that currently don't, uh, don't necessarily get to use them. I'm with Carson. Oh, Carson. Is, is he still here? Yeah. Awesome. Hi, should I just speak? <laughs> Please. Well, you should, you should introduce your community. I, uh, my name is Carson Block. I used to be gainfully employed, and, and now I'm, I'm on my own as a uh, library technology consultant. Um, and uh, it's been extremely exciting to be out and to be thinking about uh, the idea of DPLA as a platform. As, as Alan talked about, we've got content challenges, right? And, and libraries, uh, public libraries, are used to thinking of content in terms of things that we purchase in some way. And that's valid uh, as far as uh, content goes. What I'm really excited about with DPLA is that this gives us an opportunity to take what's, what exists now but is invisible and make it visible for everyone uh, in, a, in a very, very powerful way. So not just um, in a static way, like come and, come and see it, but there's going to be um, ways that it's integrated into, into people's lives. And I think that, 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 that it will be transformational um, on this basis simply because of the, the design. The design is really rich. Everything that uh, we've worked on, uh, that, uh, that everyone has worked on in the different work streams, um, from the governance to the, to the nuts and bolts of the, the technology are really syncing together really well. So I'm, I'm thrilled about that, that concept of taking things that exist now, things that we paid for with public dollars uh, that are kind of invisible in a lot of cases and uh, making them vivid in HD. Thanks, Carson. That line about making the invisible visible is uh, something we could probably get new stickers for. <laughs> That'd be great. Celia. Hi, I'm uh, Sheila McAllister. I'm with the Digital Library of Georgia, and um, we're located at the University of Georgia. So not only are we a research library, but um, we represent the land and sea grant institutions of our state. And there are a couple things being a res uh, having that kind of role um, really brings out. And so we have, we are really concerned with service and outreach to our, to our, um, our whole statewide community. And DPLA, as um, the folks from um, Boston Public mentioned, really does, re will reach out to, um, to all sorts of different communities. But um, I think what's really exciting from a research institution is the opportunity for our faculty and our students to use this platform to create new and innovative ways of, of looking at, at the problems that are facing us, new methods of scholarship and the like. So we're very excited to be involved in the project. Other people with ideas about how their communities will build on top of the platform or potentially be drawing from it? Margie? I'm Thanks. Margie Avery and I'm a, I work for a publisher. I work for a nonprofit scholarly publisher. So I'm really excited about what this uh, platform can do in terms of providing an infrastructure for a lot of the materials that we try to publish but aren't actually able to include into a book. So currently we have, uh, whenever I'm approached by authors for publishing something, there's so much stuff that we have to leave out. And some of that is reasonable to leave out. But a lot of it is because we can't print it and we can't, uh, we can't accommodate the material. With the DPLA platform, we can uh, link to these primary sources. We could link to letters, um, photographs, um, 
videos, images of things that, that are not able to be described in print. So I, th I see this as really enhancing scholarship as well as connecting scholarship with its original resources. So. So, yeah, some of the specific app ideas people were, were floating around yesterday included a lot of ways to pull back enriched metadata or to, to enrich existing local sites for small institutions. And to both what uh, Margie and Michael were saying, I certainly think that should make everyone's current institution and current sites um, a place for people to test out and experiment with those new things. Something that's beautiful, independent of, uh, of the global vision or, or the global aggregation of, uh, of local collections. And I guess I'll just bring it all the way down to <laughs> the ultimate user. I just went up to the Yo Media while, during the break. And what I can envision in the very end is young people that will never get to Cairo, that will never get to all these other places. It's going to open up the world to them. And that's when you think about what that can do and what it will do for those kids that are right upstairs from us and what they'd be able to touch primary sources in a different way. So I really want to encourage people who have, who have worked with children and who've worked with, with audiences and are, are building their own local participation networks to think about ways that that could inform what VPLA is doing and uh, ways that that could guide technical decisions that are being made uh, or interface decisions that are being made. As Jeff mentioned, interface is being, a global interface is being designed in the next couple of months. But the interfaces that people build on their own on top of instances of the DPLA tools will, will be um, fertile ground for other, other kinds of interface experiments. And just one final comment is, again, that for those of you who haven't had a hackathon in your library spaces, I really encourage you to do it. Get a couple bags of giant Doritos and some Mountain Dew, turn on the lights, let Tell it go, answers. and come back a couple hours later and see what people have built with your content and the DPLA platform. If you want to hold a hackathon and you're not sure how to do it, but you have mm -hmm. space, please let us know. Mm -hmm. And we can help you organize something. We know there's going to be this one in Tennessee in a month. There's going to be something attached to an audience and participation event in Virginia in December. I think we've now decided, mm -hmm. December 6th. So um, something, there'll be something small and, and uh, maybe for half a day that we're trying to organize at Harvard. So if you, if you have the, the enthusiasm and you're not sure what it would, what it would take, um, talk to us, talk to Nate. Think of it as a 21st century Tupperware party. Oh. <laughs> and we'll turn it back to John. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Please join me in thanking SJ and Martin and their team. All right. So this is our very last session. I just want to share a few thoughts on what you can expect in the next several months leading up to the April 2013 uh, kickoff, but also to make space if anyone has any, uh, any final comments or questions unrelated to the uh, technical discussions we've just been having. Um, I want to hit just a, a few key points which restate where we have come recently and, then, and where we're headed. Um, as noted, we've formed the new board of the DPLA and we have the new 501c3 set up. So in the next several months, we'll be moving from a very draft form of bylaws and uh, charter and so forth uh, to a more fully form set. So if you have an interest in governance type work, let us know and we can, um, we'll be online in the governance work stream, but also uh, taking suggestions of that sort as we go forward. Um, second, we've obviously made a huge amount of progress on the um, uh, content and scope uh, work stream, which has led into the Digital Hubs pilot uh, with Emily Gore now on the ground. We're uh, fantastically staffed initially. We'll be building out uh, a, a team around Emily and also obviously operationalizing those first seven uh, hubs. We are on the lookout very much for additional content partners. 
Uh, we will be trying to figure out what that partnership agreement looks like. It may be that you will come forward to us as an institution and we'll say, we'd love to work with you and announce as a content hub, even if we can't actually ingest the content before April. So let's figure out how we can make a rolling thunder up to uh, April in terms of announcement of institutions that wish to participate um, and help us figure out what that partnership agreement should look like. And I think uh, Emily said it beautifully, there's a structure for doing this. We wanna try to reduce the one-off, one-to-one uh, relationships between DPLA and institutions so that it doesn't get too complex. Um, but we wanna have a, the kind of agreement that can be um, scalable and effective across a range of different institutions. And the more that we can set up these uh, uh, arrangements in advance of April 2013, even again, if we don't ingest the data or metadata initially, I think that's gonna be very helpful for people to see uh, where we are going. Uh, third, we've talked a lot about the um, content um, uh, in terms of how it will be delivered in the technical terms in the last uh, two sessions. Um, we will be, of course, completing and launching the first prototype. And again, this is just a gesture. This is just a prototype in April 2013. So don't expect too much of what you see then. Um, and we have to figure out how to talk about it in a way that lets people see the, uh, the vision of where we're headed um, without getting too disappointed in, in what we uh, experienced at the beginning. Um, but I do think it's gonna be fun and interactive and um, there are lots of ways to contribute to that as you've just heard. I think the idea of 21st century Tupperware party sounds fabulous. So if you would like to host such a party uh, in the form of a hackathon, we will be glad to um, provide some support for that uh, in various ways. I think we could do a whole pile of them between now and uh, April 2013 and continuing and I think one of the things that has excited many people about this project is how we're taking the spirit of the open source community, the spirit of the Wikimedia community or Mozilla or Creative Commons and bringing that into um, this kind of knowledge uh, space. And I think that's something that with uh, the leadership of SJ and Martin and David Weinberger and others will uh, continue to do. Um, and then last, of course, continue to build community across all the different uh, aspects of the work that we have together. And you can be looking out uh, uh, to the board um, for our uh, suggestions of how to do that and how we segue the steering committee and the work streams into a committee structure that will hopefully engage people uh, in the work going forward to April 2013 um, and way beyond. Um, I'm going to pause there for a second. I'm looking down at my um, colleagues, uh, Maura and Dora and others. Is there anything that you would want to um, have us remind the crew at this, at this stage? I think we're jumping out. One last uh, call out for any, oh yes, Doran. I would Thank you. want to second your earlier comment when you were up there about that um, this is as much about communities, about a product. I think yes. that's really important. I think that message is evidenced by today and I think going forward even, it's something that we need to keep talking about because I think that's a really key part of how we should define ourselves. Absolutely, I think one of the ways in which we have sought to make this project different from ever, other efforts to create National Digital Libraries, whether here or around the world, has been saying we're totally devoted to this being about the end user and about the community of people who care about these materials and doing it in a truly inclusive way. We've got to keep ourselves uh, honest in that way and, and really try to make this a model in, in that respect. So we will continue to emphasize that as we, as we start to launch. Other thoughts or questions to, to share? Anyone from the live stream who feels ignored? Happy to have you uh, tweet in or email in. All right, well, I think that we are at a point that we actually can end early, which is very exciting. Um, I'd love to have one final thank you to the people who worked so hard to make this happen, both at the Chicago Public Library and at the Berkman Center Secretariat. Please join me in thanking that crew, and we'll see you all in April. Thank you.